In the last episode of Trail of Tears, we explored the remaining few mounds, bird effigies and other structures that remind us of the ancient people that used to live in central Georgia. However, to meet Muscogee or Creek Nation people in the Piedmont region today, we have to cross the state line to Alabama. The native tribes were removed from the southeast to Oklahoma in the 1830s, but a porch band of Creek Indians remained on their land. In this episode, we'll visit their reservation located in Porch, about 57 miles east of Mobile, Alabama, and try to learn their story. The first stop is the Porch Creek Indian Museum. So we're here at the Porch Band of Creek Indian Reservation. Uh, the Porch Band of Creek Indians are the only federally recognized tribe in the state of Alabama. And so uh, the Porch Band of Creek Indians are a unique, have a unique heritage and you know we're still here in the state of Alabama. There's this common misconception that there's no more Native Americans here yeah, in the state, yeah. but yet we're still here and we have this very unique story. And so I mentioned that we are the only federally recognized tribe in the state of Alabama. Um, Federal recognition is basically what allows us to be a sovereign nation. So where you are right now on the Porch Band Creek Indian Reservation, you are on the sovereign territory of the Porch Band, right? So meaning that you're no longer in the United States, you're in another country. Another country. Right. We have our own constitution, bylaws, you name it, right? So, but that doesn't come without proving that we are Aboriginal people, right? The United States government is not going to give a group of people sovereignty, right? Mm. We had to prove without a shadow of a doubt that we descend from the indigenous peoples of, of Alabama. And so we have a very unique history and very unique culture. So um, one of the things we like to do is debunk those stereotypes and myths that people have about Native Americans, mm. right? Throughout the United States, there's over 570 tribes that are recognized by the federal government. That's 570 different languages, stories, yes. histories, cultures. Yeah. So um, it's not fair to lump all these tribes together. Yeah, there's tribes that wore the feathers. There's, there's tribes that lived in teepees, but that's not the case for every single tribe, right? So here in the southeastern United States, we did not live in teepees, right? Yeah. We lived in uh, a part of the country where the soil is very great for planting crops, so they survived off crops. And the term Creek Indians came from the Europeans because yes. our towns, or what we call in our language, idolas or villages, were always located next to a body of water. That's where the, when the Europeans arrived, oh, those are Creek Indians. And it's yes. a nickname that kind of stuck with us. Yeah. So, but you're actually Muscogee. Yeah, right? Muscogee <laughs> is our traditional name. But the, the term Muscogee even is a nickname primarily because it comes from an Algonquin speaking language, meaning the people of the swamplands or the people of the wetlands. Um, traditionally speaking, Creek people would call themselves the town that they lived in. So. The Creeks were a collection of a bunch of different tribes that spoke the same language up and yeah. down the rivers of Alabama and Georgia. So for example, Tallahassee, uh, Opelika, Silicaga, all of these were traditional town names and that was what these people claimed to be. And it wasn't until maybe the mid 1700s that these collection of towns banded together to create what we know as the Creek Nation or the Creek Confederacy, which is a collection of all of these towns. And they, they have political, you know, spite. So they would, you know, play the British against each other, the French against each other. And then along came the United States and it kind of got a little bit more complicated from yes. there. Um, but yeah, so we're here here in Alabama. We're a federally recognized tribe. We, we still we, we do our best to keep our culture and our language alive. So we, we, um, we have five people on staff. Their everyday job is to learn and teach the language. Um, the goal is to create, you know, uh, immersion programs, anything of that nature to provide the language here. Um, to That's keep Muscogee, that Muscogee. The Muscogee language, absolutely. Okay. Um, and then we do, uh, we practice our traditional dance, our traditional, you know, art. So whether that be patchwork, basket weaving, pottery, shell carving, there's so many different, you know, unique art that the Creek people created. And we're trying to revitalize that and keep, keep that alive because that is what makes you Creek, right? You know, a lot of people, you, you think that you have to look a certain way, right? It's 
it's not high cheekbones or long hair like that's it's all it's, it's all make believe it's stereotypical <laughs> right it, you know um i mean i may look like a white guy but my mother is creek and in, in creek culture matrilineal uh, that lineage you know it, that's what's important is but being indian is here it's not about how you look right or, right a card that you carry how come this tribe didn't leave during the trail of tears okay i'll put it in a little timeline 1790 there's this treaty sign that treaty is called the treaty of new york and it was a collection of a bunch of creek micos or chiefs here in alabama that traveled by horse and buggy to new york to um sign what they thought would have been a peace treaty between the creek nation and the newly formed united states this is under the leadership of george washington and the treaty implements a lot of different things, but one of the most notable things was that it would allow the federal government to build a trade route along or through Creek territory in order to get to the Port of New Orleans. They hadn't quite got the Port of New Orleans yet through the Louisiana Purchase, but signs are pointing toward it, right? So you need to get that trade route from the Northeast to Port of New Orleans. Well, where do you have to go through? Directly through Creek territory. The road ends up being built, I think, the, the treaty signed in 1790, but I think the first time they really start building or developing this road is 1809, 1810. But basically this road is a collection of larger paths, small paths, <laughs> trails in the woods. So it's not what we would know as a road today, but yeah. it's a collection of horse paths and yeah. paths, right? You begin to see Americans and, and whatnot begin to establish on this road creating conflict right because one of the ideas was is they could use the road to travel through but not to stay on or overwelcome right. overstay their welcome right 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 well you begin to see people claiming land that isn't theirs you, yeah. around you, you, this road right <laughs> so you begin to see this these complications between the creeks and the americans and yeah. ultimately so there's two sides of the story so you have creeks that relocate on this road to the Tinsaw area or to the southern part of this road. And they move for different opportunities, raising cattle, ferry drivers, innkeepers. There's so many different things that the creeks were able to, you know, use, utilize on the southern end of this road. Meanwhile, back in the ancest our ancestral homelands is primarily the Alabama, Coosa and Tallapoosa rivers near, Mo near Montgomery, Alabama. Mm -hmm. And there's a collection of creeks that are still there that you begin to see a conflict arise uh, and that ultimately became known as the red stick movement and yes. so the red stick movement is a creek civil war primarily you had creeks fighting against each other and you also had creeks fighting the americans yeah. and so you have this big fiasco going on meanwhile there's these creeks that relocated to that tensaw area the southern part of that road right we're the descendants of those creeks that's why we're still still here so you have kind of all of the warfare and stuff going on uh, in the middle of the state. And ultimately, it was a domino effect that ultimately led to the Indian Removal Act being signed in 1830, became known as the Trail of Tears. And there's this misconception that only the Cherokees were removed on the Trail of Tears. That's not the case. All it five was nations, all, right. all five of the civilized tribes, if you want to call it, that were removed, forcefully removed on, on this, um, during this, I mean, it was practically a Holocaust. It might as well have been, yes, right? Yes, yes. So you have these creeks that are forcibly moved to Oklahoma. However, there's still a portion of creeks still in Alabama. That's how we were able to avoid removal. We're the descendants of those creeks okay. that relocated for that opportunity on the, okay. on the federal road. Gotcha. So do you still meet with your tribe members in Oklahoma and all these other places? You know, we're the same people. We're just split by this period of history, right? right. Um, and you still speak the same speak language. The same language, same traditional dance, same ceremonies. We're just split by yeah. a, a, a period of time. So yeah, we, we still have a relationship, a working relationship with those guys and we reach out to them, we travel there all the time. Cool, that's cool. So how big is this reservation? When we talk about trust land, so land that is put into trust by the federal government, the reservation itself is not very big. It's approximately 300-ish acres. Okay. So it's very tiny in terms of that. Now, the tribe has acquired a, a bunch of land surrounding the reservation, which is, I'm not, for lack of a better term, I think it's called fee land, but I'm not 100% sure how it works. I want to say they just pay the taxes on it. But yeah, they they've bought up surrounding land, but as far as actual trust land and reservation land, 
about 300 ish acres and okay. our reservation is considered a checkerboard reservation meaning it's not continuous so we have okay. a portion of land here portion of land uh, up the road and then maybe there's a few portions of land that are in trust near the Montgomery area okay and where's the main city is it Atmore, Atmore or um so Atmore is actually well yeah that was what when we say we're going to town we would say we're going okay. to Atmore but it's not affiliated with the tribe so the gotcha. tribe here Porch Alabama is where we're located right now and a lot of people ask what porch means and and we've had a lot of discussion so porch isn't some ancient term. So when we say Porch Band of Creek Indians, we're saying we're a band of Creek Indians located in Porch, Alabama. And Porch, from what we gather, is there's a railroad that runs through the reservation called Porch Switch. And from what we gather, it, you know, most railroad switches or whatever like that are have names of maybe the captain that drove the, the yeah. train, you know, whatever that may be. <laughs> yeah. So we're thinking that's maybe where that comes from. Okay, so how many people live on a reservation? How many people can actually trace back to <laughs> so, uh, Creek Nation? When you, when you talk about enrolled members of the tribe, you're looking anywhere from around 2,800 members, 2,900 not members, so not very many. Um, it was actually above 3,000, I think, prior to the pandemic. So we did lose a few elders during the pandemic. Yeah, yeah. So um, but yeah, about 2,800 members. But as far as living on the reservation, uh, you have about 900 people that live. Maybe or I'm not 100 percent sure of the number, but that was a number that I had okay. last heard. And but that doesn't all include tribal members. You, you know, you have like for example, my my household. My mother's Creek. My father is white. Mm. So my father lives on the reservation with my mother. So you have you have situations like that as okay. well. Okay. So he's not. Creek member, right? Mm -hmm. Right. <laughs> okay. Yeah. All right, cool. Very good. Thank you so Absolutely. much. The Porch Creek natives of South Alabama lived in isolation and poverty, and they didn't have a chief until Calvin McGee stepped up in 1948. He was a farmer with only a fifth grade education, but Chief Calvin was very intelligent, soft spoken, and served tirelessly his people. He helped change the education system to accept Creek children into schools, fought and won a large compensation from the U.S. government for land taken from American natives in the 1800s. His efforts resulted in a federal recognition of the Porch Creek Indian Reservation. He also helped other tribes achieve recognition from the U.S. government. My friend, can you imagine the courage and sense of purpose of Chief Calvin McGee, his tireless work, and his sacrifice to help his people? He did not hesitate to meet any government official who was willing to listen to his case. And this includes President Kennedy in 1962, when they met in Chicago. Jeff Kay's first remark when they met was, I've never seen a blue-eyed Indian before. Chief Calvin calmly replied, you've seen one now. A perfect example of why a purpose in life is more important than any fancy degrees, titles, or high salary to live a meaningful life. Chief Calvin McGee passed away in 1970, but his memory is forever etched in the grateful hearts of his people. Rest in peace, Blue Eye Chief. I think it's remarkable what Porch Creek Nation was able to accomplish here. They have their own government buildings to serve their people, their own schools, their own police department. It's just impressive. And uh, I think this community will continue to grow and be around here for a long, long time. Good ride. Oh, thank you. Have a good lunch. Do they have a good lunch here? Yes, Indian taco is very good. Okay.
beautiful country, and it's easy to understand why it has caused so much conflict in the past. But we are making progress, and people are learning how to coexist in peace today. Regardless of the news and hopeless messages we hear on social media, I found hope in this small community. I didn't know what to expect coming here, possibly angry natives with protest signs to get off their land. What I found was exactly the opposite. I met happy and welcoming people. They are proud of their culture and are trying to revive their language, storytelling, handcrafts and arts. My friend, don't believe any dark predictions about humanity's future. Yes, there are problems and challenges, but people always find a solution. Most people today understand that war is not a solution to finally achieve a lasting peace and that we have to start working together to protect nature, historical sites, and preserve different cultures of all people. I hope you will join me on this journey to the past and different landscapes. Let's see and learn the truth together.